tēnā koutou. Uh, ki o koutou o ku rangatira, uh, o ku tino hoa, ne nā tanga tō rongo nei, kei te roro hiko. Uh, e rere ana nā mihi ma te koikui ki o koutou. Uh, ko hara mai nei i pāna te kaupapa whakuhirahira ki a mai tātou. Um, it is, in te ao Māori, the moral of the story is never waste the last word. And um, normally it's given to our kaumātua, um, who you think have that role by virtue of their age, but it's not that, it's their while. Because what they do with the last word is manage to weave everything together, be delightfully provocative while looking cute, and... Um, <laughs> I have neither the age nor the while to pull this off, but that is what I'm going to try and do. And um, in doing so, I'm taking the second half of Te Maide's, um distributed responsibilities. Um, so w with this final word, uh, I want to start with something that potentially sounds like a bad joke, but it's not funny, which is what do colonisation and climate change have in common? It's not funny, there is no punchline. Um, they've got Locke and Hobbes and a whole lot of dead political philosophers in common, is the answer. Because when we look at those long dead political philosophers, what they thought was that the domination of land, having dominion over land, was what took us to the epitome of civilization. And our lack of dominion over the land at least as they perceived it, was what rendered them, or us in their eyes, savages. We were in the primordial state of nature, incapable of being recognised internationally. That's the root of colonisation. Equally, that ethic of dominion over the land is what has brought us to the point of climate change. That ethic of dominion has had consequences for our hum humanity and our planet, which has also another point of connection between colonisation and climate change, and that is the point of catastrophe. At the turn of the 20th century, what the writers of the day said was that their job was to smooth the dying pillow of a dying race. The fact that we are here, with some of us looking utterly resplendent, um, is a miracle. That was you, Miss P. Because we were foretold to be gone. We're at the same point of catastrophe as we all know when it comes to the climate and our planet and our planetary boundaries and our ability to live or not and our common humanity. But then the other thing that colonisation and climate change have in common is that we bottled stubborn optimism nine generations ago. And um, I inherited the Naitahu settlement when I sat my first law exams was pretty much the same day that the Naitahu Claims Settlement Act was being passed in the House. And that legacy is one utterly of stubborn optimism because there is nothing about being at quite literally the brink of being eradicated from this planet to now being in a place where I can celebrate a bountiful inher inheritance, um, which means we should be anything but optimistic. But I'm not going to stop there, because I think that there is something else that the legacy of stubborn optimism that Indigenous peoples can carry um, and do carry, and importantly, can share with you all. Because it would be quite common at this point for a Māori speaker to tell you soothing tales from our traditional knowledge, but that's not my lane. And instead, what, what I want to talk to you about is our practices and what I think our practices can teach us all. And the first is the power of small deeds. And I think in New Zealand, we're really uncomfortable with small deeds. Maybe it's kind of the equivalent of short man syndrome. We're a small country, so we don't like small things. Um, we like to be the first to grant women the vote, and we like to be doing grand international statements like nuclear-free. But I think actually what things like the Naitahu settlement 
teaches is the smower power of small deeds. So one of the things in the Naitahu settlement, which when I was young and impetuous and probably a bit arrogant, I didn't understand at all, was the power of the place name changes. So in the Naitahu settlement, and in all settlements that followed, there are a raft of place name changes. And I used to think, but there is so much egregious, unconscionable history. How can place name changes be at a level commensurate to offset the horrors of that history? And then as I got older and started to appreciate that um, it, it's not just radical protest action that changes the world, uh, I realized the power of place names is that it changes habits. So that now it is the exception to be on a plane when they actually fly, and the pilot doesn't mention Auraki. That power of changing habits is remarkable, and I think it's something we need to get more familiar with, because we expect, and perhaps with the naivety and impetuosity of youth that's got a long hangover, we expect that grand normative winds will change the world. We expect that the Declaration of Women's Equality will translate to pay equity and a reduction in domestic violence. But that grand normative change has done neither of those things. What has moved us closer to those are the small steps, the changes to habit, the changes to daily routine. And um, that's what place name changes did. So just over 20 years ago, when the Naitahu settlement was passed, it um, caused outrage that we might refer to this landscape by its original names. And now it's just a habit. Now it's just an expectation because day by day, small step by small step, normative change actually came through habit, through routine. And that's something that we've all got the power to do. So my first challenge is to look at our daily habits and our daily routines. But then my second one is that I think something that is quintessentially Māori is that it's what we do might not actually be the point. And um, for many of us in here, who have been set up to do something by a kaumatua, thinking that we were gaily going off to do whatever it was that they told us to do, only to later realise that they had a devious plan and that they were actually taking us on a little tipu haere journey to something completely different. What we do is not always the point. And our laureate tonight talked about the importance of convergent solutions. We don't have time for sequential solutions. We need them to all converge. Well, I think one of the most important challenges from Te Ao Māori is to look for divergent solutions. Because we've got um, also the challenge from our laureate that change in the 21st century is non-linear. It's going to be exponential. But what if we also expect our change to be non-linear in how it happens? We, we all know in our personal lives that if we try and do something with direct laser focus, we give up and have the best idea in the shower. So why is it that we expect profound social transformation to come from a straight line relationship? Why is it that we expect a particular problem to be solved by something that is directly, causally linked to it because of those damn political philosophers and the rise of the Enlightenment. Our obsession with direct causal relationships has a direct whakapapa to Enlightenment rationality. And um, I know that all of the most profound transformations that inspire me have none of those characteristics. And equally, lots of the things that we laud, so I don't get in trouble for um, telling stories without permission, I'll use non-Māori examples. Uh, so, so there was a thing that turned into one of the greatest public health uh, successes. Got 50 million people 
out walking within a really short time frame do you think it was a public health campaign no it was pokemon go yeah <laughs> yeah so pokemon go was obviously not intended to be a public health solution and if we had asked public health experts to design something that would mobilize 50 million people within something like 19 days or something ridiculously short, they wouldn't have come up with Pokemon Go because they anticipated, they would anticipate a direct relationship between problem and solution. And, and I think within Te Ao Māori, we know that, we know that not expecting that direct line is how we create genuine, deep transformation. And um, putting some language around it, just to justify my academic position I sort of do on a daily basis, um, I, I think there's a difference between um, what some might call a social engineering logic, which is where we expect that direct relationship between problem and solution. Um, if you are not um, in work or in employment, we will educate or employ you. That's social engineering logic. Um, we've also got um, commentators predominantly on the left that will talk about participatory logic, where um, it, we should distinguish between things that are done to people versus things that are done by people, with the in expectation that things that are done by us or done by a community in a particular position will have more impactful outcomes because they're not being engineered, um, they're being done by those um, for whom they matter. But I, I think within Te Ao Māori, we've got more of an activation logic. We will do something that enables someone to discover something intrinsic in themselves or intrinsic in their community that allows deeper transformation. And if we want to get away from a world that is full of band-aid solutions, where we have a temporary direct solution to a particular thing, then we're going to have to embrace non-linear transformation pathways. And um, to do that, I think it comes to the third thing that Indigenous peoples can contribute to this kind of conversation which is that self-determination is both the means and the ends of this journey. And our laureate talks about the future that we choose. Self-determination, lots of people will hear, is an argument for political succession and political institutions. Maybe, but most fundamentally what self-determination is, is the ability to choose and chart a destiny. And we all have that ability to choose and chart a destiny. But another legacy of the Enlightenment is that it presumes that it's done on the micro-individual level. And, and there's lots of discussion in this um, climate change context or in, in any grand challenge about the power of the individual to do something that in composite creates a tipping point. And our laureate encouraged us to use our tipping point powers by voting with our money or our enfranchisement or whatever it might happen to be. But, but what if you take from the indigenous example and anticipate that self-determination is something that is collective? Because something remarkable happened this year. Something remarkable happened through the exercise of Māori self-determination. And that remarkable thing is that for the first time since the 1860s, Māori had better, I'm just going to repeat that word, better social outcomes than non-Māori. Can any of you think what it was this year that enabled Māori at scale nationwide to have historic better social outcomes than non-Māori? Did you even know that it happened? Probably not. Um, COVID lockdown. Before the lockdown, all of the scientists, quite reasonably, were saying that Māori would have at least twice the infection and mortality rates of non-Māori. And if anything, that was conservative. 
because in the 1918 pandemic, Māori had seven to eight times the mortality rate of non-Māori. And after that lockdown, Māori were less likely to experience um, a COVID infection than non-Māori. And there's, there's lots of reasons that could be put to that. The, the science-based lockdown response was brilliant and it was important, but what the last 150 years have taught us very clearly is that even, in, even good, well-intended mainstream policies produce worse social outcomes for Māori. It doesn't matter how intelligent they are, how, how principled they are, mainstream solution is going to produce worse social outcomes. So it wasn't just the lockdown, it wasn't just that good and brave and courageous approach to the team of five million that led to Māori having better social outcomes than non-Māori. It was that there was a instant Māori response network to COVID. That instant Māori response network that had the highly politicised roadblocks, that had a distribution network of not just food and practical resources, but the things that make us us happening in a virtual environment as well. It was a comprehensive Māori response to COVID, which meant that we changed history. But we changed history in a way that most people in this room don't know. So I think that to, to genuinely have self-determination alive in our communities, there's to be a really active meaning-making process as well. Conversations like this, where we make meaning out of small deeds, where we make meaning out of collective processes. Because one thing that made the Māori Response Network work is that we have got the most developed collective mobilisation muscle. We know how to do that. We mobilise all the time when someone passes or when something beautiful happens. There is like a secret mafia network inside this community that means that we can get a marquee in a massive pot anywhere within under 30 minutes. Um, and... Um, so we've got to make meaning out of these processes, these things that we do, and understand not only their significance, but the mechanisms that enable them to operate. Because if government, Minister, I appreciate this is not within your portfolio, but please feel free to be a messenger nonetheless. Um, because if, if government wanted to replicate that rarest of rare examples, of Māori having better social outcomes than non-Māori. Um, I'd, I'd suggest that there are very few public servants that could explain to government the mechanisms that enabled the Māori Response Network um, to be as effective as it was. And ultimately, that is about meaning-making from the things that we take for granted. And that applies in our daily lives as well. I think there's also... Um, just so we don't feel too hopeful at a climate change event. Um, I, I think there's also another challenge that goes with that as well, which is normally when I talk to non-Māori audiences, there's typically an uncomfortable question somewhere along the line about what are you prepared to give up? And um, in a year where um, the notorious Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed, um, I, I've found lots of cause to use one of her oft-quoted lines, which is, um, for those with privilege, equality can feel like oppression. And for us all here today, we've got climate privilege. We've got COVID privilege. Um, it doesn't matter where our whakapapa is, we live in a remarkably sane and safe country. Um, and out of that remarkable privilege, we've got a few points of shame. That uh, I forget which cop it was we got the Fossil Award. Um, some of you are wondering what the Fossil Award is. The Fossil Award is that um, award that nobody wants. 
it's the in the um, negotiations process it goes to the nation that is doing the least so we pride ourselves on um, being audacious and being a hundred percent pure but actually we carry the fo- we've carried the fossil award we carry the statistics about child poverty um, we carry statistics that are just like the US about our incarceration rates so there is I think a radical honesty that is needed when we ask ourselves the question about what will we give up because the status quo will continue unless we are intentional about small deeds that change habits unless we are open to transformative ideas that don't rely on rationality in straight lines but otherwise embrace our humanity and the ways that change really occurs and until we really claim what it means to be self-determining. And as an inheritor of the Naitahu settlement, one thing that I see in our community is that spending seven generations fighting for justice, fighting in a very real sense, for survival, for justice, is not actually a preparation for building self-determination. There needs to be a bridge. What got us here will not get us there. And I I think that absolutely stubborn optimism can be a bridge that takes us from the status quo into building the new, but I don't think it's enough alone. I think there are two other things we need. And the first is collective imagination. And um, I, I think imagination is important, not just because it sounds lovely, and like a nice thing to do on a Sunday afternoon. But because collective imagination enables us to see the real causes of the real things that really matter. And collective imagination gives us permission to do the things that might terrify us. Um, But collective imagination um, also needs a friend. And quite literally, we all need friends. Uh, I heard Jason's question about... um, what, what's the warm-up activities that we'd expect our rangatahi to be doing? Well, one of the practices in Te Ao Māori that um, I don't think that we have carried through enough is that most of um, our, our chiefly types didn't get there because they were the best person for the job. They got there because when they were young, someone picked them and made them do something they were utterly unprepared to do. So um, collective imagination, I think, should be partnered with where's your rangatahi? Who are you taking with you? And um, I'm not sure that it's, in, it's ethical anymore for them to literally carry your bags, but um, it, it, at, least, um, it, at least having rangatahi, and while they're there, asking yourself the question, what are you prepared to give up? Are you prepared to give up more than just a plane ticket to wherever you're going? Um, Because, and and this is my concluding comment, which I'm sure some of you who have been too polite to eat your desserts will be grateful for, um, is that using that collective imagination to ask why it is that for Māori, the strategy of picking someone and putting them in a context to do a job they weren't prepared to do, was important? Was the mechanism underneath that that mattered, that created the transformation um, for that person? Well, I think the mechanism that made that work um, is the one that Michelle talked to with that um, almost eye-watering photo um, of the graduates, which is belief. So for marginalised people, for colonised people, Um, There are a range of political philosophers who weren't white um, that have said the most devastating consequence of colonization is that we lose trust in ourselves. And when we're talking about an age of self-determination and an age of choice, to make a choice, there has to be trust. There has to be belief. But I think quite often to get us to the point where we can do that, we need a jump start. We need a jump start 
from someone else's belief. And when I think about all of the remarkable practices within Te Ao Māori, the thing that they have in common is that someone else believed in someone else. That spirit all began. And when they believed in that person, it wasn't just that it was unconditional belief, it was that it was clothed with expectations. If you let that old person down, emigrate. Leave the country, doesn't matter if the planes aren't flying, there's still one or two that I literally run away from um, because I've, they gave me their belief. They clothed it with expectation. And, um, and I think that what we need to do here tonight is to clothe each other in expectation. Because when I asked the, um, the various chiefs who were put in their place by someone who believed in them and pushed them to do something they weren't prepared for, when I asked them, so who have you done that to? Apart from a few, they looked at the ground and said they hadn't. Why is that? Because they got colonised and thought it was proper to let these amazing rangatahi choose their own futures. But actually, I think they were denying those rangatahi um, opportunity, courage, a catalyst to be. So I challenge you all to ask yourselves, what are you going to give up? Who are you going to believe in? Who are you going to jumpstart? And what are you going to expect them to do for the world? Because I, I can tell you a few things that I expect all of you to do. Because I know quite a few of you. And I know your potential. I know your roles. I know your talents. And um, that knowledge is arguably the most important component to belief. When we talk about manakitanga, it's quite often one of those words that makes us feel good because we, we think about hospitality and being cared for. But if you've got to manaki someone, you've got to know them. You've got to genuinely know them. You've got to genuinely care. If I can see Raf there needs a pen and I throw it at him, that's not manaki, particularly if it's not the colour of pen that he wants. So if we are genuinely going to do all of those things, then we've also got to deepen our relationships with each other, um, which is the reason that I'm most grateful to be here tonight, um, sharing with you uh, under um, an envelope of expectations that you will give up something tonight, that you will take someone with you tomorrow, and that collectively will self-determine a better future. Nā reira, tēnā rau